Hello, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you here. I think we all enjoyed yesterday, and uh, some people enjoyed yesterday evening, so that's why the th crowd is a little bit thinner than, <laughs> than before. Um, the sec this is the second day of MMSYS, and we have a great program. I would like to introduce Torger Hovden. I hope uh, pronunciation is somewhat uh, close. Um, he's going to tell us about uh, streaming media at Komoyo. And just to give you a brief introduction, he is the CTO uh, for Telenor Digital Services and uh, yeah, Telenor Komoyo. And he has extensive, ex extensive experience in software development, technology, leadership, strategy and industry trends, having worked in the software business for about uh, two decades and especially the last two years with uh, Komoyo at Telenor. And he has two master's degrees from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in computer science and technology management. So he has knows both sides, technology and uh, the business aspects. So we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Does this work? No? It's on? Okay, so um, let's get started. I'm going to spend uh, my talk giving you some views on, on, on how uh, we as a commercial vendor uh, of streaming media um, looks at both the, the business uh, and, and the technology aspect of it. So uh, we are putting into operation uh, the kind of, of, of technology and, and um, ideas that you guys are developing. Um, typically, a number of years after uh, a paper at a conference like this. So uh, just to start out by stating the obvious, and to the, to the media industry, this is not necessarily obvious. But uh, it should be obvious uh, to you, and it's certainly obvious uh, to, to us at Komoyo, is that the internet will uh, deliver media and entertainment sorry, to any device. And this trend will continue until, uh, in our view, all media distribution is based on IP and at the end uh, the open internet. So people might uh, disagree with me on, on, on this one. Um, you know, some companies providing uh, cable services or, or, or things like that might argue that uh, the quality of service aspect is so important that you need control over, over uh, uh, parts of, of, of the delivery. But in our, our view, and the sort of the hypothesis that we're working from, is that give uh, it sufficient time, all media will be delivered over the internet, including film and TV. So this is the sort of... Uh, uh, the underlying belief that we're working uh, from. So, uh, so who are we? So, uh, Telnu Komoyo uh, is a company started about two years ago. Uh, it's uh, it's owned by by Telnu. Um, Telnu is is the uh, the big uh, telco in 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 Norway. Um, but Telenor also owns uh, media businesses. Uh, Canal Digital is the biggest um, provider of, of, of TV distribution in, in, in the Nordics um, and has a satellite business and, and also a cable uh, business. But this is a separate, separate company, a separate entity uh, focusing on internet-based uh, services. 
and part uh, of Komoyo, it's not all of Komoyo doing, uh, doing streaming media, but uh, a big chunk of Komoyo is about streaming media. And so far, um, we have th roughly three uh, different kinds of services that we've done uh, so far. Uh, first one, this one is uh, the, the transaction video on demand. Um, and it's really about the new, new films uh, coming out on, on DVD or Blu-ray. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it's available uh, in a transaction store. So this is, this is on the web. Uh, and there are a number of these available, so we're not the only player here. Um, the second area uh, that we're doing is, is live TV. So um, this particular one is, uh, is in, in Norway, where we have around uh, 17, I think, uh, live TV channels. Um, available for streaming on the um, on the web. Um, and the uh, the last area that we've done streaming is live events and in, in particular um, Tip League on in Norway, which is uh, so the uh, the football league. So the, the the premier football league in, in Norway. So <coughs> let's let's start with the uh the live aspect of it because uh there's not that many at least not uh here providing live streaming. So uh for our setup uh we d we did tip league on uh last year and tip league on is really about you have a live signal you need to get that signal out on the internet in a reliable manner so it first starts with a uh, mobile unit at the football stadium uh, this picture is not from a from a norwegian football stadium uh the the stadiums here are a bit smaller than that um but there is a there is a truck typically at at the stadium uh connected to some uh, some cameras and if i'm not mistaken most of the the actual uh basic production uh happens at the stadium in in the truck then um the signals are are um delivered here in our case and this is uh this is uh Telenor broadcast it's uh, <coughs> uh facility in Nittedal um uh, some miles outside of Oslo um and uh as you can see there's uh, the, there's satellite reception for uh for taking down all kinds of tv channels and distributing it over cable and so forth but the um the tip league on signals also go into into Nittedal. And then this is a just a very rough overview of, of how that works. So on on the left side here, uh it's it's all you know traditional broadcast technologies. <coughs> so I'm not too familiar with, with the technical details of all of this, but um the uh, the streams are typically uh, JPEG 2000 encoded, and uh, there's a there's a broadcast uh, interface format called SDI uh, used. And then, as you as you get sort of to the to the right of this, you start to gradually come into uh, into the internet world, where we have a set of uh, encoders that take this uh, JPEG 2000 stream 
and encodes it. In our case, <coughs> uh, we encode into <coughs> um, an adaptive HTTP streaming format. We've used uh, Microsoft's uh, format. I'll get back to to why and, and how that uh, is, is done. There are alternative formats uh, available as well. And then <coughs> um, the live stream is pushed onto a CDN. And from the CDN, uh, the delivery of, um, of the stream is, is more or less the same um, as on any on-demand uh, content. So, so what's the challenge uh, we've seen in delivering live events or streaming live events? So one obvious one is that everyone wants to, to, to view the content at the same time. For a, for a TV channel, having you know, uh, programs of interest uh, to different people at different times, that's one thing. But if you have a football match, everybody wants to, to start viewing at the same time. And uh, they will view in this roughly two hour period or, uh, or an hour and a half period. And then they're gone. So uh, ev even though the number of users as such might not be enormous, everyone uh, wants to be there at the same time. So um, even if you have 50,000 uh, users, which, which is roughly the, the sort of scale that we had uh, last year, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, people trying to get in, and since this is a this is a pay-for service, it's not just the streaming; it's also making sure that you can authenticate users. Uh, it's a for-pay service uh, in this case. People need to be able to um, to pay for their subscriptions uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, just five minutes before the, uh, the beginning of the game. And I think <coughs> uh, one thing that should never be underestimated is the uh, anger of a football or soccer fan who is not able to, uh, to watch his uh, favorite team play. So we, uh, we also get very direct and clear feedback when things aren't working. Uh, <coughs> so, um, but there, there's also uh, a number of opportunities uh, in in the live events, since it's 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 really uh, mostly broadcast uh, problem, at least conceptually. But we're using um, we're using point to point uh, kind of delivery. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to to. Uh, how we can we can uh, leverage uh, ca caching effects and, and so forth for this. That's uh, that's a bit later. So uh, the streaming part of this. So this is this uh, initial uh, thing was about live. So you have. Um, an aspect where you have an event and then uh, you deliver the live signals to a live encoder rig and then um, after encoding it's pushed to the CDN. So uh, from that, there, that point uh, the, the streaming is, is the same roughly uh, for live and, uh, and on demand. And for <coughs> The streaming, uh, we are using adaptive HTTP streaming. Um, I think it's pretty clear that for this kind of service, uh, everybody's moving 
in this uh, in this direction and there are uh, very good reasons for this but uh, I guess this is uh, something you, you you guys know much better than than me but from uh, from my point of view uh, adaptive HTTP streaming is about a couple of things uh, first um, you encode the um, the video into several quality layers or, or bit rates um, and then <coughs> each the the stream is is uh, sort of uh, partitioned into into chunks or segments and each chunk or segment is uh, given a unique address or, or URL and then there's a manifest file um, describing the available bit rates and uh, how to construct the uh, the actual URL for a particular segment and one important thing is that the the segments are uh, immutable so they are they are cacheable and I'll, I'll get back to that um, from um, uh, from the client's point of view, uh, the client is is the one actually determining the uh, the, the quality, <coughs> and this uh, this is uh, this is an important point in terms of scalability from from our point of view is that uh, the streaming as such is, is, is stateless. It's, it's using uh, standard uh, HTTP fetching URLs for these particular segments. And the client uh, has a heuristic um, to determine whether uh, it should um, increase or decrease uh, the quality of the video so it's it's really a heuristic based on how much buffer do I have what kind of uh, network bandwidth uh, am I uh, experiencing and then based based on that heuristic uh, the client determines whether whether the next segment should be a higher quality or a low quality or, or the same quality And uh, today, there are a number of, of uh, providers of this. Um, there's probably more than that. Uh, so the uh, Apple has a format, Adobe has a format, Microsoft has a format. Um, so these. Uh, formats are more or less the same uh, but incompatible uh, which is uh, which is a problem for for us and the, and the rest of the industry um, and um, maybe mpeg dash will uh, will help that we'll, we'll have to see uh, but for now we use the Microsoft uh, format um, and sort of the the actual uh, codex used in the stream is not specified as such in in how the chunking uh, and how to request the, the different chunks and how the manifest is so uh, for for most of our content we, we use uh, h264 uh, we've also used VC1 for some some of the live content. Um, so um, there's um, there's a choice there as well. Um, but hopefully, from 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 our point of view, if if these were one open format that would work across uh, different different clients that would be good and currently it's not so um, 
for the actual delivery, we use a standard um, content delivery network. Uh, and the way that that works is that the, the source content is uh, pushed to an to a origin server. The origin server does not serve uh, end user traffic. For that, you have several uh, edge servers. This is an example from Akamai, but we uh, we have the same same setup. And then uh, the end user will will request content from this. <coughs> uh, for adaptive HTTP streaming, this is just standard HTTP, no no special magic uh, protocols, uh, and uh, that's. That's a very good thing. Yes. No, we have Telnode has a, has a CDN in in the Nordics, so we're using that. Um, so currently, we offer services in in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, going outside of that, we would probably use um, somebody else's CDN, whether it's Akamai or or, or somebody else. Well, you could probably. Uh, Your is to, uh, you know, yeah, there's there's some some business rules around around that. Uh, for Tipper League on the soccer league that we did, uh, we had um, users all over the world, and uh, that was okay from um, uh, for you know Norwegians with a Norwegian uh, credit card on holiday in in uh, in Spain that was okay but it was not okay for uh, for um, uh, foreigners to use this service and that was sort of part of the uh, uh, the agreement on the content so there's a there's a sort of a business side to it and there's a technical side on the technical side it's more about um, uh, bandwidth and latency for the for the actual segments um, if if we were to have a few customers outside or in another country, that would be probably fine to deliver over internet. There's uh, here in Scandinavia, there's been a lot of users who have uh, used VPN uh, <coughs> connections to the U.S. in order to use Netflix when Netflix was not available here. And that worked for them, and the transport of those streams were on the open internet. So, but uh, for sort of the, the big um, volumes, you would have to, uh, to think about how to get uh, sufficient bandwidth to your users. Um, yeah. So, uh, specifically, we're not using peer-to-peer -peer type uh, delivery mechanisms. Um, and uh, there are some, some reasons uh, for that. Um, one is that, <coughs> at least in the Nordics, uh, Telnur is also a, a, a provider of internet connectivity. And uh, the, the, the backbone uh, here uh, is um, has a has a high capacity, uh, and the CDN is is um, connected directly to to that. So, uh, in delivering, at least to to customers that are Telnur customers or or close, um, it's really a one you deliver the content from the CDN directly, uh, and there's currently sufficient capacity on, on, that, on that network. Uh, a peer-to-peer -peer solution would probably um, cause more traffic on that network. Uh, from, if, if you look at sort of the, uh, the, the uh, ISP perspective, so that's one um, one aspect. 
and um, and then there's the the complexity in the clients. So today uh, you can you can use any HTTP client and fetch uh, the segments. The segments are are um, are um, encrypted, and I'll get back to that uh, in a while. So you can't just uh, just view them in any any viewer, but the actual transmission of that segment is is uh, is simple. And um, managing sort of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, code on the clients uh, will complicate things compared to our current setup. So that's another reason. So, but uh, as as I said earlier, the uh, we use a CDN, uh, and we have uh, some experience with uh, with live, and we've done some um, some investigations with with the help of uh, of uh, Simula. So uh, the question there was: so we have this this CDN on the right hand side, and then there's there's an internet. We don't know what's going on on the internet. Then we have some clients. Uh, but if all of these people want to watch the same stream at the same time, and uh, the stream is composed of cacheable segments, and it's standard uh, HTTP, uh, is there a cache effect? So. Um, some some ISPs might have uh, caches uh, at the edges of their network to ensure that uh, the same content for from newspapers or whatever isn't you know uh, downloaded from the origin every time. And we were wondering if if we could see sort of the same effect for uh, for live streaming since a number of people or many people want the same sort of URL at the same time. And uh, initial um, results from, from this uh, indicate that there, there is indeed a, uh, a cache effect and that it's, it looks, uh, at least uh, from the preliminary results, that it's, uh, it's significant. So that's interesting, because uh, even though you know conceptually it's a, it's a point to point, the client requests the, uh, the 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 segment from from the CDN. It's actually delivered from transparent uh, proxies caches uh, somewhere else in a uh, in a significant number of uh, of uh, or percentage of the cases. Um, for for on-demand uh, content and especially long tail type content, uh, you would not see that effect. Uh, but for live, um, it looks like uh, this this effect is is significant. And it's also uh, interesting because. <coughs> The way the internet works uh, and who pays for for what and, and, and peering and whatnot, uh, the ISPs might have an incentive to put these kinds of caches in place. So it's uh, it's it's interesting, uh, at least for us. Um, so. I think this is a this is a technology conference, uh, but I want to spend some time also explaining the media business because this uh, is an extremely important uh, element of what we're doing. Um, 
and traditionally, uh, content and media has been sort of roughly this value chain. And this is not my my uh, area of expertise, so that's the dis disclaimer, and this is my view on how this works. Uh, but you have somebody producing content. Uh, you typically have somebody that aggregates content from several sources. There's a distributor, and then uh, the content that is delivered to the end user on, uh, on some device. So quickly, the content, you know, film studios, um, here in uh, Norway, there's, uh, there's the uh, national broadcaster that produces some original content, um, for example. Then there's the aggregator. Uh, there might be uh, television channels doing. So NRK is also an aggregator of, of they have their own content and, and content from others. Uh, there's companies like Seymour that uh, aggregates content from from several sources. And then uh, there's the distributor. Uh, so Viasat uh, has a satellite business. Riksteva is a Norwegian, um, you know, I don't know the term, but on the on-ground ground signal uh, delivery of, of TV. Canal Digital is a Telenor company, uh, both cable and satellite. And then there's the uh, sort of the odd thing up in the corner. Um, and we could put Komoyo there as well. But what is interesting uh, is, is how this business is changing. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to that. And then the last point is devices. So on the top, this is where um, media has been delivered. You have some sort of set-top box or receiver. Um, most are, are digital now. They used to be analog, connected to your TV. Uh, it's a satellite dish. But things are changing. So people are, are uh, consuming media more and more on the kinds of devices on the, on the bottom. And a lot of those are not TVs or the traditional ones. What is happening is that <coughs> previously, in order to deliver media to the end user, uh, the barriers of entry for that market was uh, very high because you need some very expensive infrastructure. You might need a satellite uh, in orbit. You might need uh, cables to every house, like, uh, like in this picture. Um, and uh, the internet changes all of that. And, and you know, to you that might seem, <coughs> yeah, you know, uh, that's not something new. We've known this for years. But for, this, for, the, I for the industry, this is changing uh, the whole set up and it enables for example companies like Netflix have you anyone seen this series yeah so uh, this is the s second original series that Netflix did and it I, I believe it's it's one of the more expensive but Netflix is actually producing their own content. So if you sort of have the, the, uh, ch the delivery chain or the value chain of the content, the aggregator, the distributor, and the device, Net Netflix is just piggybacking on the internet and they are sort of moving backwards in that chain. So they are um, acting as a content producer. They are aggregating the content into their service, they're distributing it, uh, piggybacking on the, on the uh, internet infrastructure. They also have some, some CDN activities of their own. And then they are providing uh, clients to all kinds of devices. So they're sort of all over uh, the, uh, 
the value chain. And these were different companies uh, previously, right? Uh, HBO, another example. So uh, they've previously worked with distributors such as, uh, as uh, you know, Seymour or the premium TV channels and so forth. Now they have their own service, delivering uh, their series and, and films directly to the, to the end consumer over the internet. And um, you are also increasingly seeing the traditional uh, distributors and aggregators trying to get a play on the internet. So via play is the uh, the via sat. Uh, sort of internet service and what they're trying to do here is uh, to compete with the likes of Netflix and so forth in delivering content on uh, over the internet uh, but their traditional business is in um, in uh, you know uh, delivering TV <coughs> over satellite maybe cable I'm not sure if they have cable uh, but the the interesting thing is that for or traditional core business, just as uh, for Tenlur and Canal Digital delivering this over the internet, which has a potentially disruptive character for their core business, uh, is uh, is a, is a challenge. But this is what we're sort of uh, experiencing, and and Komoyo is coming from, from Telnur, or that also owns Canal Digital. So our, uh, our challenge is to compete with the likes of, of Netflix um, in providing a good service. Um, and everyone in, the, in this business is trying to be, be relevant on the internet, as you can see now. Uh, here on as uh, via play also. <coughs> so uh, this is a cutting edge uh, conference, and I'm going to share a little bit of of my views on on the technology side of this. And uh, keep in mind that I'm not an expert. I've been working with streaming uh, for two years, so I've learned a lot in those two years. Um, but um, uh, this is more what will actually work from a um, commercial vendor point of view. So I think the first thing is this. This is the uh, the king of media streaming today uh, in terms of uh, of, of codex. Uh, there are some competitors, uh, but this is. Uh, what you need to to deliver your content in why because of the s the thing in the middle there this is a low cost uh, piece of hardware I don't know what it does but I do know that um, the uh, system on the chip or sock in the middle there has a native H264 uh, at least decoding capabilities it does not support uh, other codecs. So just the um, the fact that every device from very low end to you know uh, to high end devices will support um, hardware decoding of H.264 means that f for a commercial vendor there's not really that many alternatives. So, um, um, there are probably, uh, you know, better codecs for, for, uh, for um, you know, certain kinds of content. We've seen for, for the football stuff, uh, we saw better results, at least in, in what we do w did with VC1 in terms of the fluidity of, 
of uh, the pictures when there was a lot of movement. But I think <coughs> currently, if, if you want to reach all the end users, you need to do this. Maybe there's a five there in, uh, in a number of years, uh, but I think that will take a long time because you need to replace the billions of devices that has a chip like that uh, with uh, another device that has a chip like that that supports um, hardware decoding of the new codec. So that's one. Uh, there's, a, there's a big push, uh, at least from the broadcasting side, on this as a, as a sort of a new standard. Um, I think from, from my point of view, the most important contribution that this could, could give us today is uh, a standard way to specify uh, the adaptive HTTP stream and sort of the manifest format specifying the stream. The actual stream would be H264 uh, for us for a, for a long time, I think. Um, but, but today it's, it's, it's a challenge that uh, the, the, the sort of the, the packaging format is different. Um, another thing that is a big challenge for us is, uh, is the DRM, digital rights management, encryption of the content. And this is something that, <coughs> uh, it's not something that, that um, we necessarily uh, is pushing this technology or this technology. Uh, this is content owners that um, put as part of their contracts with us that they uh, they need us to do uh, DRM using uh, one of a number of, of of sort of supported DRM technologies and having a standard DRM so the, the easiest thing for us uh, of course would have to be or would be to have no DRM uh, but that's not currently realistic uh, because the content owners uh, um, want their their content to be to be protected so the next best thing would be to have a DRM that is, is standard so that you can uh, you can decode it on on any device supporting that I think we're a bit uh, far away from that as well. Um, which brings me to, to my next um, point. Over, there's, there's been a small revolution, at least in my head, on how uh, rich HTML5 as an uh, as a application um, environment has become. And with um, HTML5 and the video tag, um, you are seeing rich media and video being streamed uh, using uh, standards directly into your browser without the need of, of any plugin or, or, or anything like that. There's been a sort of a, uh, a fight in terms of, of the codec, whether the patented H.264 codec uh, should be supported by, uh, by the standard or by the browsers. Uh, Mozilla and the Firefox has been opposed to that for a, for a long time, for example. Um, but I think, uh, at least from my point of view, um, due to the the fact that H.264 now is uh, supported natively in, in billions of chips, 
uh, means that for now that's the winner uh, and that is also uh, the codec um, most video on the web is using there's still no support for DRM but I'll get back to that the other uh, interesting technology <coughs> is the, uh, the WebRTC. Um, and uh, I know there's a, there's a panel here um, afterwards, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We are using WebRTC uh, for our real-time communications products in Komoyo. That's not the streaming thing, but um, you know, voice over IP and so forth. Um, but this, this is interesting. Uh, I haven't spent too much time looking at, at sort of the, the core details of this. But one interesting <laughs> aspect is that this brings UDP into the browser. So if you're, uh, there might be some, some, some opportunities here that is uh, opening up. Maybe you'll do peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, streaming or, or <coughs> distribution using this technology. I don't know. You guys know more about this than, uh, than me at this point. But it's, uh, it, it's very interesting to get real-time communications into the browser. Um, and uh, there will probably be a lot of applications also within, uh, within streaming uh, using this technology. But the... Uh, the main hindrance today on the web for commercial delivery of, um, of film, TV, and so forth is, uh, is DRM. So that's the big Achilles heel. Uh, and from what I see, there's, there's little indication that uh, you know, the industry will go away from, from this requirement. Um, so this is a proposal by Netflix, Google, and Microsoft, I think, uh, for how to support DRM in, uh, in um, HTML5. I think the, uh, the proposal is um, controversial. I think a lot of people, from I ideological reasons, want do not want DRM technology to be a part of uh, of the open uh, standards of the web. And I think this this pro specific proposal also uh, simply describes a method to exchange uh, keys, but it does not does not specify on the bottom there uh, this decryption technology. So it's, it's sort of deferring that to, to something else. And, and from, from my point of view, if, if you have sort of a way to, to do uh, DRM content in the browser, but the actual decryption module is not standard, then we're really not where we want to be. Because where we want to be is that any content is uh, available on any device. And if you need sort of specific um, proprietary decryption modules, then you either need those decryption modules to be ubiquitous, like H.264, or uh, we have basically the same problem as we have today, where you need a plugin on the on the client, and uh, and it would be nice to be able to stream this content um, without a plugin in the browser, for example. But from from my point of view, we're pretty far from from that. So uh, it will be interesting to see uh, how the business will develop, whether there will be sort of lighter weight uh, content protection schemes 
or uh, how that's going to develop. But in my view, this this is a this is a hindrance from uh, uh, for innovation in this area. And then. Um, Um, I think what is, is clear, this is a picture of different applications uh, or different uses of uh, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is a small computer, uh, costs $25 or something like that. It's a full-featured computer. The system on the chip, the system on the chip has uh, H.264 decoding in hardware, of course. Um, can do full HD, and uh, it's being used for all kinds of things. And I think uh, hardware that is capable to do full HD media streaming will be everywhere, uh, as the Raspberry Pi sort of illustrates. So. Um, This will, will enable us to do, do sort of rich, rich media streaming to, uh, to anything. Uh, because every little device will be a powerful enough computer to do uh, full, full HD streaming. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to round off with the, uh, the content distribution problem because if everybody's streaming uh, you have a capacity problem and um, I think even though there will be caching effects for live and so forth uh, currently there's uh, not enough bandwidth to sort of replace the current media distribution through, uh, through broadcast with uh, on-demand uh, over the internet. Uh, I, for one, is uh, extremely convinced that this will happen. It will take a number of years, but it will happen. Um, but a key question then is, is who should pay for that capacity, right? And this is a this is a this is a an ongoing ongoing game. Um, should the end consumer pay for the capacity? Should uh, the content providers pay for the capacity? Uh, should the ISP pay for the capacity? Uh, should it be sort of a combination of the three? Um, but the delivery of, of HT content uh, is a lot more bandwidth extensive than delivery of a, of a web page. So um, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting journey to see how that plays out. Because uh, this we do not want. And uh, from an end user's point of view, when we do streaming, it needs to be as reliable as uh, your, uh, your TV. And the TV just works. There's no buffering. There's uh, no hiccups. It just works. OK, so I'm, uh, I'm through my presentation. Maybe we can go to some, some questions. Yes. Okay, first let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> a great talk. And, uh, okay, I have several questions, but I'll start with the basic ones. Um, so, given that Mega Upload, uh, Izohant, all those pirated content websites, uh, they actually reside in Nordics. Uh, you know, uh, I know that the Nordic people are quite, you know, rich. They are not really, uh, yes. you know, uh, having any trouble to pay for content. But um, 
uh, how many of your customers are actually using this, uh, uh, you know, copyrighted material versus pirated content, and how do you uh, how do you compare your services against Netflix? Yeah. And uh, HBO is also available in Nordics now. Yes. Um, uh, with all you know, with all that competition, how do you actually differentiate yourself from uh, those competitions? And uh, regarding your own customers, for example, if you are offering uh, the internet connection to someone, do you actually give a pre uh, you know preferential uh, treatment to those customers over uh, customers who are using some someone else as a service provider? Okay. So uh, I'll do the first first question. Um, um, first, the, uh, the the pirated uh, or the pirate bay uh, question. So uh, I think, at least from this is my personal view, I think uh, people are not, at least here, do not have a problem paying for the content if they get the content uh, in a convenient manner and they get the content they want. Uh, we see that with Spotify, the the the, the um, rate of piracy for music is is going down, and people are paying for the for the content because it's convenient, it works, it's better than than Pirate Bay. Um, <coughs> currently, uh, there's uh, if you look at the available content, it's very fragmented. If you go to Netflix, uh, you don't get all the content on Netflix. If you go to Komoyo, you get a different set of content, but you don't, don't get all the content. If you go to HBO, you get the HBO content. So it's very f uh, fragmented. Um, I think uh, one challenge in the business is to, to be able to... Uh, if you use Pirate Bay and, the, and what you can actually get on Pirate Bay uh, in terms of content uh, as a benchmark, if you can make that legal and provide that as a convenient service, uh, I think uh, users would choose that. That's that's my uh, my thinking. So we, we have a we have a challenge uh, challenge uh, there. Sorry, just wondering how much is your monthly. How much is your monthly uh, service fee versus uh, how much is Netflix or HBO? Yeah. I have no idea. So, so, so currently we do not have a subscription service. So we're working on that. This is, yeah, this is pay-per-view. And uh, the subscription, we have a subscription service for the, the live TV. And I think the live TV is uh, 129 per month or something like that uh, now. And to your, uh, to your next question, about uh, the preferential uh, treatment. Um, I think <coughs> it's Telenor uh, is uh, uh, focused on, on uh, supporting net neutrality. So there, there's no sort of blocking of Netflix or anything like that. Uh, at the same time, there's there's uh, there's a quality of aspect uh, um, uh, concern in that if you can put uh, the CDN directly on the, the 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 core network, you will get better quality of service, right? So uh, what um, Telnur is doing is that um, <coughs> the CDN is is directly on the on the core network. Uh, Telnur is offering others to put their service on, on the core network as well. Um, uh, for, um, for, uh, for a fee. And then um, there's no sort of different treatment uh, based on where the traffic comes from. So there's, there's peering uh, and so forth and, and there's no, uh, there's no sort of uh, selecting this traffic over this traffic, um, but there's there's sort of the the two layers. You have you have uh, distribution connected directly to the network, and you have traffic coming in through peering and so forth. And the uh, the directly connected um, distribution will um, have a better quality of service to you, those customers that are using or connected directly to that net. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, I have a question related to broadcast and streaming. Well, actually, this slide, when you say that you don't want buffering and you don't have buffering when you're watching TV, that's not st strictly true, right? When you're switching channel, you have to wait. Yeah, There's sure. There's buffering. And uh, the, 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 the assumption that broadcast will disappear because everyone w will want to have uh, on-demand content and they want don't want to have linear content Maybe it's true, but I don't. I, I don't think it will be a a total switch. No, Broadcast no. will will coexist with broadband content. Mm. And I wonder if you have any uh, view on the hybrid delivery and and synchronization aspects and how how you could use a mix of broadcast and broadband content at the same time. Yeah. I, in terms of, are, uh, is the question based on the l delivery mechanism, or? So uh, I totally agree with uh, with you. The, the the linear aspect is not going go going to disappear when there is a sports event like football. You know, people want to to watch it live, right? Um, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, <coughs> opportunities in in. Um, uh, when we deliver it like this, you, you can you can go back in time. You can re rewatch that goal, um, and and so forth. Uh, we haven't looked into combining sort of broadcast technology with on demand, so that if you watch uh, watch the, the football, uh, it's it's traditional uh, traditional broadcast using traditional broadcast signals and sort of augmenting that with on, on demand. That was the question. We haven't looked in into that. We're looking at, at, at streaming. <laughs>